Turn in your Bibles with me to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to be beginning this morning in verse 8. We've been studying this letter. It's the first letter that Paul wrote to his son in the faith, Timothy. Timothy, he had left um, in the church at Ephesus, which is modern-day Turkey. He had left him there to set things in order. And now he's writing him a letter concerning proper conduct in the church, how people should act, how they should behave, what leaders should look like, what servants should look like. There's so much instruction in it. It's one of the uh, what we call the pastoral epistles. Um And we've been finding out some pretty amazing stuff, I think. Uh, 1 Timothy 3.15 here says, and this is really probably the main theme of why he's writing. And he says in 3.15, I'm a little ahead of myself, but I, if I'm delayed, he says he's going to come to him, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. Listen, isn't that what we want to know? Isn't that what a Christian should want to know about life? How do I conduct myself in the house of God? It's his house. We're his people. We've been bought by the blood of his son. And if you live in somebody else's house, shouldn't you obey with common courtesy their rules? Their, their, their guidelines. Shouldn't you want to pick up after yourself? Shouldn't you want to be some type of a servant and be humble and grateful for them allowing you to be in their house? I mean, it's, when we start to think about these things, it's only reasonable that we would want to have an instruction book that would tell us how to conduct ourselves. So see, we started this last week. You remember we talked about with, with overseers, and we got into this really, and we were talking about an apple cart that got upset. So I want to bring you back to that, because this is the, the little analogy that I need to use in order to keep us in line. Remember, Genesis 2, God created marriage. Genesis 3, the devil rushes in and knocks over the apple cart. And then we start trying to pick it up and put the apples back on the cart, but they're all bruised, they're all damaged, and, and we get it out of order. And so now we have instructions in how to put the cart back up, in how to put the apples back on the cart, and which ones to eat from and which ones not to eat from. But the same thing happened in Acts chapter 2, and we're going to go to the book of Acts in a little bit, but Acts chapter 2, what happened? The birth of the church. Acts chapter 3, the devil rushes in and starts to attack almost instantly. And he's been attacking ever since, trying to turn the apple cart back upside downward and over and get his God's people in God's house to eat from the wrong side of the cart, to eat from the upside down cart, to leave the cart laying down and go, no, it's okay. You don't have to pick the apple cart up. Just eat off the ground. But we serve this mighty God that doesn't want us to eat off the ground. He wants us to have an abundant life. He wants us to eat the best of the fruit. He doesn't want us to eat marred up fruit and, and, and live in a, in, a, in a way that's haphazard. He wants us to walk in freedom and liberty, but he wants us to walk in that freedom and liberty by his power and his, with his spirit according to what his word says. It's the pillar of truth. This is the truth of the kingdom of God, and, and, and to walk any other way doesn't make sense. So he writes us in how we should be conducting ourselves. Listen. The church at large is not living according to the word of God. They're not living according to the truth of God. They're not living according to the instructions that we find in these 66 books by 40 authors. We've made up some other type of life to live. And I'm not trying to beat the sheep or, or say anything bad about God's bride. But all we have to do is go back and look at this word and say, well, what did God say? 
It's not listening to the voices that say, did God really say? We have his recorded word right here. And all we have to do is say, wait a minute, the word of God says. That's what Jesus said when he was attacked, when he was in the wilderness. He said, it is written. The word of God says. Well, how do I do this? Well, the word of God says, this is how you conduct yourself. This is who's supposed to be leaders and overseers. This is, and I believe that all of this, now see, I'll, I'll get in trouble up here. See, because I believe every single one of us is a leader in the church. Every single one of us is a leader in our community and our sphere of influence. I believe that every single one of us, if we have the truth of God's word, then we know more than the blind people we're working with. So we become the leader. We become the witnesses. We become the ones who should be setting the pace on the work, on the work floor or in this classroom or wherever we're at. Because we know truth. But we let the world set the pace and we begin to follow what they're doing. And it should not be. It should not be. Listen, I believe that these qualifications here are for leadership or overseers in the church. But it doesn't mean that, oh, well, I'm just a regular sheep. I just get to walk around and do what I want. No, this is what we should be desiring to be. Every person, listen, you go on your job and you talk about the boss and you say, well, if I was the boss, I would make it like this and I would do it like this and we would do it like this. So in the church, we do the same thing, but we should be desiring to take these positions, desiring to be in the position of a leader, desiring to be in these places that God has set out. And how do you do it? You begin to lay your self-life down and you begin to serve people around you. And you don't just consider yourself, but you consider others. And you begin to ask God how you're supposed to conduct yourself. And Paul would say, down the corridors of time, these are the leaders. You don't become a leader because Greg goes, you're a leader, you're a leader, you be a leader, you be a leader. No, it's because God ordains leaders. The problem in the church today is, is if somebody's doing pretty good in the business world out there, we make them a leader. Why do we do it? Oh, we want to make sure that they're tithing okay. We want to make sure that we notice that they're doing good. That's not the Bible. Simply not the Bible. You can do great in business and be a horrible Christian. You can do great in business and not know the word of God. You can have manners. I was talking with Shirley earlier. You can be prompt. You can be on time. You can say, yes, sir. You can say, thank you. Has nothing to do with morality. Has nothing to do with Christianity. Nothing. So we began looking at what the Bible calls here bishops. elders, overseers. I'm not ready to clump pastors or shepherds into this. Although I do believe personally that pastors need to have the same qualities and even higher than these elders, these bishops, these overseers, these deacons. Even more so. But it's also something that we're growing in. We're aspiring to be. And none of it is possible except what? The blood of the Lamb, the finished work of the cross, by faith, with the power of the Holy Spirit. You can't live a Christian life without those elements. You can't live a Christian life without first entrusting your spiritual well-being into Christ. The finished works of the cross, being covered in the blood. And then beginning... To say, well, what does it mean to be now baptized into the house of God? Now, how should I conduct myself? Now, how should I thus live? And, and he tells us, don't consider anything flesh and blood anymore. It's all spiritual now. Now, with that knowledge, it should change the very way we look at every little bitty thing. Is that it's spiritual. It needs to be spiritually discerned. Oh, they were talking, that's spiritual if they were talking about you. It's spiritual. 
It's not physical, so you can't go revile for reviling. You can't go and confront that in a physical way, or you will end up reaping what you sow. It's a spiritual problem. It's a spiritual kingdom. It's a spiritual house. So we must have our conduct in line with the spirit of God to do the work of God and to serve people according to the glory of God. Okay? And we covered, again, like I said, we covered the bishop. We covered, uh, and I like to call it an overseer because that's basically what we're doing. We, we have stewardship of God's possessions. Listen to me carefully. And it may include chairs and carpet. It may include a building and some grass or some gravel. It may include an organ if you're in a more traditional church. Whatever it may include, do not miss that it's souls. Because all that other stuff gets in the way of working with souls and loving on souls and serving souls and building up souls and bringing people to salvation and to a personal love relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's what happens is we begin to deal with this business and budgets and buildings and all of this other stuff and we forget about the souls of mankind. And that's what we've been called to deal with. And that puts us back into perspective. The conduct has to be remembered that it's about the souls of men. And we are going to give an account about the souls of men. It's better that a millstone be tied around one's neck and cast into the ocean than to cause one of God's little ones to stumble. That right there, that very thing should wake us up in how we are living as witnesses for the living God and how we are conducting ourselves in the house of God. The biggest difference between an overseer of um, souls or overseer uh, that we call a bishop or an elder the biggest difference is that that person is supposed to be able to teach the word of God they're supposed to be able to expound on the word of God and instruct with the word of God now it doesn't mean that the deacon which is the thing we're going to look at next that the deacon doesn't know the word of God because again we're dealing with souls so if a deacon is supposed to be thinking about growing, thinking about going, a deacon is supposed to be thinking about dealing with church matters and knowing that they have to deal with them in a spiritual way because we're spiritual. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit here. So let's go ahead and read chapter 3, uh, beginning in verse 8. We're just going to cover about five verses this morning. Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience, but let these also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things, let deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own house as well. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Father, we give you praise and glory, and um, we don't even attempt to try to figure this stuff out without your spirit. Lord, we want to conduct ourselves according to your righteousness, according to your holiness, for your glory, according to your house and your kingdom for such a time as this. And Lord, we ask you to teach us this morning that we would receive with meekness the implanted word for the continued saving of the soul. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, the first thing I've noticed, and I don't know if you've noticed it, but I really feel like and it's just my opinion, because I'm a man, I feel like these are in the reverse order than what they should be. 
I feel like we should have been looking at the deacon first and then moving to the elder. Because everything about the deacon has to be true about the elder or the overseer of the soul. And, and, and it's really, it's kind of almost like in reverse order. So the only thing we can assume is, is that it must be because God is looking down. And he sees it from that order by the Holy Spirit. Because when I look at it, I think, well, if we did the deacons first, then we could have just added some stuff. Because that's the whole point. When you look at 13, the word really in the King James is the word to degree. And it means to step up. It means to, to step up from a, from, a, from a platform or from, from a step. You know, you're going to step on stairs. And I'm not talking about climbing a corporate ladder. But, but he says here, likewise, in the first word there of verse 8, and he's talking about desiring to move forward. If you desire to be an elder or an overseer, you desire a good thing. And likewise, if you desire to be a deacon, you desire a good thing. But in the kingdom of God, just like in any family, you don't just stay down here. You should be maturing and growing and you should be aspiring to do more and more. And you should always be on the grow. And you can do that by the power of the Spirit through the, through the Word of God as you begin to surrender to it and learn it more and more each day and you grow. So the whole point in my context there is that I feel like it should have went the other way so that we could have seen it better. But... Um, it's not, so obviously it has to be the answer. It has to be that it's from God looking down, and we're looking up. So likewise, you and I should desire somebody that just got saved, somebody that's been in the church for a few days, somebody that's in the church and, and says, I'm now in the house of God. You should desire to serve others by the power of the Holy Spirit. Listen to him. That's what Christians do. They're servants. Why? Because our God, Christ, was a suffering servant who came not to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom. So if he's our example, and he is, then our example is a servant who laid his life down. In fact, in the last night of his life, he washed the disciples' feet. Oh, yeah, well, that, you might have, but I won't be the, I won't be the pastor. Wash servants' feet. That's where it starts at, is being a servant. And when people come to Christ, it's a total paradigm shift, for lack of a better word. It, it automatically, your life turns and goes the opposite way. You're supposed to be on this little self-life. I'm chasing my career. I'm wanting to do everything. I want everything. I want to be everything. It's all about me. Doing a selfie. Doing a selfie. Hey, look at this selfie. Hey, you got a Snapchat. It, it, it's all about me. And then you get saved. And it ain't nothing about you anymore if you heard any truth from Jesus. It's all about Him. And yet we go on. We say we meet Jesus and our life never changes. The only thing we do different is go to church. That's not a Christian. The only thing we do different in our life, we don't try to get control of our tongue. We don't get, try to get control, control of our passions. We don't give the Spirit permission to change our lives. We don't put no authority in our life. And we say we met Jesus. There's a problem. The first word of the gospel is repentance. Do you turn and go the other way? We were living in the devil's house. And now we turn and we come in, into God's house. And the whole conduct of our life should be different. And if it hasn't changed, then we should be finding out why it hasn't changed. And then if it is changing, we should be saying, now what, Lord? What conduct should be different? Because I desire to be in your house, Lord, and to live according to your glory, Lord. So likewise, we should desire, as newborn babes, the sincere milk of the word, but we should desire a position in the house of God. I know that's a hard one to say. It really means the word office. I don't like the word position. Some of the words in the Bible, I don't like the way they translated it. But you should be desiring the office of someone who's in leadership. All of us want to be leaders. We just don't want to do the work to become the leader. You ever do that? You ever, when I pray, do you ever sit out there and go, I could pray better than that? You ever sit out there when, when I'm teaching and go, wait, that's not what I think it means. 
So you, you're desiring the position by your very actions, by your very heart. I know you never do that. That's people in Texas when they listen to my tapes. Well, he shouldn't have prayed that. He shouldn't have said that. Likewise, desire. Desire to be a servant. Isn't that counterintuitive? I mean, we don't want to be servants. Come on. I've been told all my life that I'm going to be the boss of some company. Everybody's going to serve me. Likewise, that ties us in with verse 1. Desire. Seek after. It means to stretch oneself, to reach after it, to covet it, to long for. It's from a word that, remember we talked about it, a mountain reaching itself up off the plain. It just stretching high where you look across the plain and all there is is this big mountain. That's the way it should be in our heart by the power of the Holy Spirit to be a servant. And I know that Romans 12 tells us that ministry or being a servant, it's a like word like this, it, it, it is a gift from God. Well, again, that's why I say there's no way to do it unless you're dead to self and you ask God to teach you how to serve. That you ask God that His Spirit would come upon you and use you for service. But as long as your desire is to keep living your self-life, then God doesn't have a place. Because He doesn't take second place. And if self is first, then self is gone in your life. In my life. And we all wrestle with the flesh. We all wrestle with letting self-life take over. And I, I'm busy doing this. Listen, it's all about souls. All about souls. I personally believe if you're not ready to give up your job for Jesus, I can't talk about Jesus on the job. I had a lady tell me that the other day. She's so scared of the world that we're talking about Jesus right in the middle of, of a building, nobody around us. And she's like, oh, somebody might hear us. I'm like, good. Maybe they'll hear truth. But I respected her because she worked there. And I didn't want her to get fired. But she was basically scared into silence. She's been a saint for 40 years. Scared into silence. Because we won't speak out. Because we think it's the world that's taking care of us. Listen, if I'm in the world's house, I'm dead. If I'm in God's house, my conduct should change. By the power of His Spirit, because of His blood. Because I have faith in Him taking care of me. And He's a good God. He's a good Father. I walked into a lady's house and was cleaning and... Um, I always try to figure out a way to start talking about them. People's favorite subject is self. So you start talking about them, and you can start inter interacting with them, and you can begin to interject Jesus. And I, I freak out all the time about how people react when I start telling them about Jesus. This lady just happened to be a Catholic practicing and she had been invited to a Bible study and she told me that the leader of the Bible study good, good reference here called on her to read from the Bible and she had been going two or three times but she didn't know where the book of the Bible was and she was scared to death she never went back ever again when I left the house, she was in tears. She was crying. I was freaking out. I'm like, lady, you can't be crying like this. <laughs> no, I didn't say that. I was just thinking that. As I'm telling her, I said, I'm sorry that happened to you. But that should not keep you away from the Bible. You need to start reading it now. Because she showed me this. This uh, I'm not even going to mention it. Well, I can. It's, it's a commentary, or not a commentary, a daily devotional called Jesus Calling. Throw it in the trash. It's, it's trash. Throw it in the trash. It's trash. But I see it in every Christian's house. Listen, if it's popular in the world, it's not popular with God. It's not proper conduct with God. 
And I was trying to get her away from it. So I didn't just say, hey, lady, that's trash. Because I didn't want to insult her. But I said, but, but that's just somebody's opinion. And oftentimes opinions are bad. I said, and she goes, but there's a scripture here at the bottom of it. One line, she showed it to me. I said, yeah, you should go read your Bible and find out what that scripture really says. That'll change your life. And so when I left, she was crying about it because I apologized to her that somebody had called on her and she was humiliated. And I said, uh, but that doesn't mean you should stop going to Bible study or stop reading your Bible. Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go read where those scriptures are at. Of everyone. I said, well, read above and read below and try to figure out the context of it and see what God would say to you. But then she's in tears because I was just concerned with her life. Listen to me. Concerned. That is proper conduct in the body of Christ. That is proper conduct in the house of God. To be concerned about souls. It's not your soul. It's saved if you know Jesus. So you need to begin to be concerned about every person you meet. Are they saved? Do they know Jesus? Are they going to hell? Because the devil has got them eating from an upside down apple cart. It's not the kingdom of God. And it doesn't matter whether you're a deacon or an elder or an overseer or a pastor. If you're a child in the house of God. This is conduct that you should have. You should be concerned about souls. Sorry, I'm getting a little emphatic about this. I start spitting all over the place. Likewise, deacons, deacons, deacons is the word, anybody want to guess? Servant. That's what it means. Likewise, see, we don't put it in, I don't know why we don't just say, likewise, servants must be reverent. Why didn't we just say that? Why are we going to give somebody a title for? The word means servant. It means somebody who runs errands. It means an attendant, a waiter, a minister. Here's what I, here's what I, um, wrote down deacons probably best put are overseers listen just like the elders but they're overseers of physical material things while being able to understand spiritual truth and understand that they're dealing with souls of mankind at the same time listen because a deacon basically is the same thing as the other overseer, the bishop, the elder, except they're not teaching. But while you're painting a wall, as a Christian, a deacon, you should know the word of God and be able to witness to somebody about God, and you should be a servant to them because of God. Because you're in his house. And, and if you say, oh, I don't know the word of God, well, then you've got to begin to do that. You should desire to do that. When I see Christians, and I'm not being mean either. Don't, don't take it, oh, hey, don't say that about me. You've been a Christian for five, six, ten years, and, and you don't know the first thing about the Bible. It's just not a good thing. I'm not being mean. I'm not trying to be, you know, uh, in, in any way bring guilt or shame or, or condemnation upon you. But again, as I always say, we want to be a, a, a doctor and we'll go to school for six years and spend all kinds of money and leave in debt just to have a career in the world. And we're talking about heaven and hell. We're talking about conduct in God's house. And we won't even read the Bible. We won't even begin a 20 minute a day read through the Bible schedule. So you can read through it in one year every year to get a working knowledge of the Bible so the Holy Spirit can draw out the counsel. And it doesn't start until you start. Deacons. Deacons pretty much are dealing with most of the physical stuff. Go to chapter 6 of Acts. Let's look at this. <clears throat> chapter 6, Acts. Remember what I told you? Church birth, chapter 2. God's a God of order. Remember we talked about that. His kingdom, His authority, His order, His instruction, spoken through His word that He sent to heal the land. 
It's living and active. It hasn't changed down the corridors of time. It still means the same thing it's always meant. It's the world that's moving. It's us that's moving. It's the sand people that are shifting. But we stand on a rock, and the rock does not move. So in chapter 2, church birth. Chapter 3, church attacked. The saints knew him. The disciples knew Jesus was with him. They stayed strong. Actually, in fact, if you look at it, I'm talking about chapter 6, but let's look at it in, in, in when they begin to, to, to stand up for the truth. It says in verse 33 of chapter 4, it says, And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and great grace was upon them all. Listen to me. How do you get power? Because of great grace being upon you. Then you get great power. Well, what happens when you get great grace and great power? Well, he tells you over here, uh, you get uh, great fear from all the nations around you. It's in chapter 5, verse 11. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. What am I talking about? God's always been a God of order. God's always been a God that, that comes with his authority. You look back in the Old Testament in the book of Numbers. Called Numbers because he counted the people. Called Numbers because he organized them. He set them in tribes. He lined them up. He told each one of them they had a, something to do. Each one of them had a place to be. Each one of them had something that they were supposed to be doing in the kingdom, in the wilderness. And guess what? If one person doesn't show up, then there's no tent pegs to set up. But God's a God of order. He put them all out there. He said, this tribe lead, that tribe go next, this tribe. Everything that he's doing is a God of order. And what happened? All the nations around them, when they listened to the instruction, when they followed the orders, when they listened to what God was saying, they were in great fear. They said, do you hear the testimony how this God brought these people out of Egypt? How he plundered the whole place. How he destroyed everything. And great fear came upon the people because his people were listening to him and obeying him. And that's what is going on here in the book of Acts. Because of the great grace, God's riches at Christ's expense, they were listening, obeying, witnessing, and, and great power was given to them. And it brought great fear, not just on the people in the church, but the people outside. The people outside the church. So what happened? The church begins to grow because they're obeying. And in chapter 6, they have to assign some deacons. That's what we're talking about. They had to say, hey, you're a servant on this area specifically. Listen to it. Now in those days, what days? The days when the church was first birthed and the devil was attacking and there was those that were mind enough to listen to what God was saying even though the devil was attacking because greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. He can't do nothing to you if you just keep listening to the commander in chief. Now in those days when the number of disciples was multiplying, he added to the church, he added to the church, now he's multiplying. I like God's math. There arose a complaint. There's always going to be complainers. Wake up. It's 6-1 it's of chapter, or excuse me, of the book of Acts. Acts of the Holy Spirit. Listen, that's the name of this book. The Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostle. Through the Apostles. It's not the Acts of the Apostles because of the Holy Spirit. It's the Acts of the Holy Spirit through surrendered vessels. There arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists. Hellenists are Greek-speaking Jews. Um, Alexander the Great had conquered everything, and the Jews had went over and learned Greek. And now Rome had came in and took everything from Alexander the Great. That's the way I understand it. I'm not, I'm not a historian. Because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Now listen, <clears throat> it's very important that we understand that there's two ways to neglect. One is you know the need is there and you ignore it. Two is you didn't know it was there, but people are still being neglected. And so when it's brought to your mind, you say, let's deal with it. See what I mean? You can purposely conduct yourself wrong in the house of God, 
Or you can be doing what you're doing and not know you're not conducting yourself well, and you're confronted with it, and you fix it. Okay? Two different ways to neglect. I'm not saying they shouldn't have been complaining. Who knows what the complaint was? But it's the Greek-speaking Jews, uh, the widows, and they were neglected in the daily distribution. It's that neglected means to overlook or disregard. So it can be two different ways. The distribution, actually, in the King James says ministration. Ministration. Guess what? The word for deacon comes from this word. Ministration. Ministration. It means an attendant as a servant, an aid in official service of relief. You're, you're, you're doing a service. And in the ministration of that service, they were somehow neglecting the Greek, Greek-speaking widows. And so they began to complain about it. Hey, hey, they're giving these other Jews a whole bunch of the Rice Krispies, but I'm not getting any of them. So it's a complaint about what? The food bank. That's what they're doing right here. They're handing out food in Jerusalem. Verse 2. Then the 12 might be the only place, listen to me, this might be the only place that Matthias is numbered or mentioned after they made him one of the 12. Notice it's 12. It's not 11. There's somebody else there, and Paul hasn't been born again yet. So it's probably Matthias in the 12. Summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, so somebody told them. See, here's the thing that drives me nuts in the church. I'm leaving that church. I don't want to deal with them people. They ain't neglected me. But you never told anybody you were neglected. You never told anybody you had an issue. You never came to fellowship and said this is a problem. You never gave anybody a chance to deal with anything. You just were self and and ran off. You were self lifing and just acted like everybody else thought you was as important as you thought you were. I'm serious. Well, they should have noticed that my shoe was untied. Well, maybe they did, but you didn't ask them to tie it. Simpleness. It's that simple. It really is. They went away and they bought green chairs and I wanted to be part of that committee. And all of a sudden you're gone. It's senseless stuff when souls are dying and going to hell. Sorry if I over-elaborate that. But it was brought to their attention, and watch what the disciples said. It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. The word desirable there in your King James is reason. They, they reason. They said it's not a good reason it means agreeable or pleasing or fit. See, in other words, the word of God was more important than washing tables. But the washing of the tables needed to be done. It wasn't something that we're just going to keep neglecting them. I'm in the word of God. See, I can't just keep, I'm studying and somebody calls me. Yesterday somebody called me. I had to leave in the middle of studying. I can't go, I'm studying the word of God. You just leave me alone. No. No, when you know something needs to be done, you go and do it. Well, what do I do about studying? God will take care of that. He knew they were going to call you. He knew the interruption was coming. He knew the problem was there. Do you trust him? It's a life about trusting and having faith in him, not in yourself. Well, my plans don't include you. Well, they should, because that's the conduct in the house of God. So they, they just looked at it, the 12 disciples, who are the, the leaders that are, that are teaching the Word of God. There's no Bible at the time except for the Old Testament. They're reasoning from the Old Testament Scriptures. They're trying to help people understand that Jesus indeed was the Messiah. The church is predominantly Jewish at this time. And they said it just doesn't make sense to us. It's not agreeable. We don't think it's fit that we should... Come over there and make sure that the Greek-speaking widows are getting food. We're going to stay doing the Word of God. So what did they do? They, 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 therefore, brethren, let me mention, let me mention, me studying the Word of God and us having a food bank, they have a direct correlation whether we do it or don't. 
Because when there's nobody to take the food bank and run the food bank and nobody's stepping up in those areas of service, then I'm going to choose the word of God first because I can't do everything. That's simple put. That's the way it is. So we have to be wise until God raises up people that would do that. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men and have them wash tables and hand out food and do it smiling. Listen, that ain't what it said. And we're talking about washing tables and handing out Rice Krispies. And I want you to notice the qualifications because we really need to get the apple cart set up right. We need to get the apples placed in place and we need people to be eating from God's table in his house with proper conduct and not just letting somebody do something because they showed up and they got a hat on their head and they go, I'll do it. That's what's wrong in the church today. That's the reason the church is apostate is because we get into this frenzy like we need to grow. We need more people. We need to go. God's in control. He knows where we're at. People come in and they go, well, you don't have a children's ministry. We're out of here. God's in control. He knows where we're at. I told a lady the other day, and I think she's going to start going to another church now. I said, if you go to a church and you notice something wrong with it, you don't get up and leave unless it's doctrinal and they won't repent. You actually go, hey, I'd like to pray about taking that position. I'd like to come in, and, and when you feel like I'm ready for it, I would like to be able to do that in the church. Because you noticed it was missing. So maybe God put it upon your heart to be that per position, to be that person, to be that servant. I feel like I'm just up here ranting and raving. I hope you don't feel that way. That would be sad. Notice the qualifications, because these are the qualifications here for the first deacons, I believe, the first people to wash tables and hand out food, something that might seem physical and material, but at the same time, it had to be people that were concerned about widows' souls, because you know what? Their complaint could cause them to leave and their soul go to hell, and they never hear the truth of Christ because somebody treated them scurriously and didn't even consider their life at all. Very important that we understand that, that your physical demeanor can cause people to walk away and never receive Jesus, and that's your witness. That's not a good conduct in the house of God. We want to meet people where they're at. We don't want to uh, uh, treat them unfairly by telling them lies because we don't think they can handle the truth. But we want to meet them where they're at and consider that they're babies that need to be touched with, hand, with, with kids gloves. And they need to be treated like the bride of Christ if that's who you want them to be. Okay, notice the qualifications. Seven men, complete number, I don't know why seven. Maybe there were seven tables, not sure. Um, maybe there was seven widows, not sure. Um, but they picked seven as the number, and it may not be an original text. It may just say, seek out men from among. The word seek there, listen, the word seek there, look in the King James, to inspect, to go to see, to look out. It's not just, hey you, get in there, hey you, get in there, hey get in there. It's not a football game. It's souls of men, it's souls of people. They inspected their life first. There was inspection. <clears throat> Good reputation. Honest report is what the King James says. Honest or good means beautiful, chiefly good. It doesn't mean perfect. It means chiefly good or worthy. And report means to be well reported of or have a good testimony. It's actually, the word report here is from the Greek martis. The Greek martis. So you're looking for somebody who's already laying self-life down chiefly and saying, you know what? I want to be a witness for Christ. It's, a, it's from the same word used in Acts 1.8. It says, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to be a martis. 
to be a witness for God throughout Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. So it has to be when you're inspecting, looking for somebody to be a deacon over material, physical, you have to also know that there's a soul involved and they have to be of a good reputation, worthy, full of the Holy Spirit. Full of the Holy Spirit. What in the world does that mean? Don't every Christian have the Holy Spirit? Full of the Holy Spirit. Listen to me carefully. Some Christians might have been baptized and the Spirit comes in and seals them, but there's power for service when you are full of the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. That's what all of Acts 1-8 is about. I don't have time to go into that. But this word full means covered upon, covered over. It means, it means full of. Not just that you have a little bitty part of the Holy Spirit in you, but you're full of the Holy Spirit. Letting the Holy Spirit control your life. Honest report, because the Holy Spirit's been controlling your life. They're, they're, people have inspected. They've already seen that there's some change going on. So you have this reputation and wisdom, full of wisdom. You know what? I'm not even going to say that. My wife would get mad at me. So, <laughs> wisdom. This is not earthly, central, demonic wisdom where you think you know how to fix some gadgets or you have some intellect because the schools of higher learning have taught you. This is wisdom that comes from knowing God. And if you don't know it, you can always pray and ask God. And he'll give you wisdom. He gives it. That's what James says. He gives wisdom liberally without reproach. So you're full of wisdom because you know who God is. So notice the, notice, the, <coughs> notice the qualifications to work in the food bank. Good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. That's just to be a deacon. Come on, anybody can do it. Not in God's house, anybody can. Not in God's house. <laughs> Maybe at your house, maybe downtown at the factory, maybe, maybe, maybe in some other church, but not in God's house. In God's house, you have to begin to deal with your conduct outside of this place. And other people have to already be talking about how you're doing. That's the way it should be done in God's house. And then I don't care if somebody's got a PhD or, or a master's of divinity. If their reputation stinks and people don't want to get near them, then they can't wash tables. That's the way God's Word says. I mean, it's, I can't change it. I'm just reading it to you. He said, pick these seven guys, and this is the qualifications. This is what we're looking for. That people's already talking about them, witnesses, and talking. They're full of the Holy Spirit. They have wisdom, God's wisdom. And whom we may appoint over this business. It is a business. It's an affair is what it says. That's what it means. And an employment place. Now we've changed that with our culture. So it's not good words to use. Probably so we can appoint over this affair would be a good uh, way to put it. Or this office. But we will give ourselves continually. Notice, notice what they were concerned about. We will give ourselves continually to counseling people. We will give ourselves continually to going out and making sure the church is promoted. We will give ourselves continually to, to, to making sure people see us in public and we're, we're all dressed right. Notice what they gave themselves continually to. Prayer. That's the first thing. That's what the leaders are supposed to be able to be doing. Is giving themselves continually to prayer and to the service of the word, ministry. Same word again. To the ministration of the word. See, some people are called to the ministration of the word. Some people are called to the ministration of the rest of the physical, material things of the church. But they have to understand that there's souls involved with every decision that they make. That's what this is all about. Our conduct in God's house. A 
And the saying pleased the whole multitude. So everybody said, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's do that. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith. Notice he might have had the gift of faith. And the Holy Spirit. Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, once again they prayed, they laid hands on them. Now what were they doing that for? Handing off some germs? I always say that. I'm, ter I'm terrible at that. That's really the only thing you can do with your hands is hand the germs. But what they were doing were noticing that these men were of good reputation. They were full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. And they were laying their hands on them and praying to agree with what God was already doing. All they did was inspect it. All they did was look for people that God was already using. And they said, okay, you take care of this stuff. You notice they didn't say, well, hey, I don't want to take care of that. See, there was authority in God's church. There was authority. They didn't come and go, I don't like that food bank. I want to work somewhere else. They were happy to be in service in God's kingdom. They were happy. They didn't argue about it. I know it's not in the text. I'm adding it. You know what's so interesting and so great and because they prayed? All seven of those guys are Greek speaking. All seven of the names were people who were probably Hellenistic Jews who got saved. And people that would be concerned about the widows of the Hellenists. That's wisdom. You pick somebody that understands them. That might even know them. It might have been one of them's grandma. Who knows? And then they prayed and laid hands on them and just agreed with what God was doing. Then what happened, Greg? Well, it says in verse 7, the word of God spread. Why? Because the uh, other elders were able to continue to minister, to pray and to minister the word of God when everybody was doing their part. The word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. Notice it was multiplying. It's adding, 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 multiplying. Now he's multiplying greatly. And a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. See, that's an important word right there. I don't know if you know it, but some of the church actually believes, and we are priests, we're believer priests. It's not the same word, but there's a great many of the church that still look back at antiquity, and they say that we're still priests. And we're still priests according to the order of, of uh, 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 what's his name? Aaron and, and Levi. And we still are called priests. And we're not called deacons or elders or, or bishops. We're still called priests. And I'm like, no. Because if we were still priests in that sense and not according to the order of Melchizedek, then that word right there would be the same word for deacon, and it's not. This is a great deal of the priest, and there's no other words in the Bible that, that, that are like that. A great deal of those that were um, in charge of the uh, God's sanctuary of Judaism were getting saved because of this happening. They seen the order in the church. They seen the authority. They seen the spirit working. They seen people coming underneath and doing their part. And even false priests, where the, the whole the whole Jewish system was dead, over with. But they were still holding it up, weren't they? And they're still holding it up today. Even though they have no temple, they're still trying to hold it up. But when they see, they get jealous. When they see people serving the true God, they're supposed to get jealous and come to Jesus. You notice that even those who are still priests, I mean, do you think what we could do to just normal old Joe down here who's lost, who needs hope, if we were living in love the way we're supposed to be properly conducting ourselves in the body of Christ, do you understand what kind of a witness it would be if we would just get the apple cart in the right place and put the apples up there and begin to, to look for souls to be saved? If priests are getting saved, I'm sure normal guys who aren't confused by a bunch of law will get saved. Anyway, we better get back. 
um, it makes it very difficult. There's a lot of this stuff in this text. I'm just telling you right now. I'm like, okay, how about somebody else get up and teach this? How about somebody else teach this? Because because it makes it very difficult when you start looking at these requirements and these things to even get before somebody or to even think, who am I that I could be a servant of God? You know, but it's because of who he is and what he's done. Nobody's perfect at being a servant of God. There's not any of them. I read the whole Bible a couple times. There's not a perfect one in there other than Jesus. But he wants you to aspire to this. He wants you to desire this. He wants you to look at this and begin to say, self-life needs to go away, and I want to live the way that God has asked me to conduct myself in his house. So back in our text, he says, deacons, servants, must be reverent. Reverent is grave in your king. James, it just means honest and honorable. Not double-tongued. We went through much of this when we looked at the bishops and the overseers. So even a person who's not teaching, but he's an overseer of material things, is supposed to think, this is how my conduct is supposed to be. This is what I'm supposed to be looking at and what I'm supposed to be doing, but I know I'm going to grow past it. And eventually, if God gives me the gift of teaching, since I already know the Word of God, I'll also become an elder. I'll be an overseer of people's souls with the teaching of the word of God. Not double-tongued. Very important here. You might say, well, I'm just a Christian and I'm not really looking to oversee nothing. And you're, Listen, not double-tongued. Well, what does double-tongued mean? Well, it might mean saying one thing here on Sunday morning and then talking like a sailor out there on every other day. Or tell them one story in here, acting one way in here, but when you go out there, you're a total different person living a self-life. If we're talking about having a good reputation, if we're talking about having a good witness to people outside, you need to be the same person all the time because of who Jesus is and because of the Spirit of God. You don't need to change for every person. Then you're being a man-pleaser instead of a God-pleaser. But when people begin to see a changed life that is repented and going the other way, and then they see that consistency because of the authority of God and the order of God, and then they begin to see that you're talking different and you're not out looking to talk about something. Oh, yeah, I've I'm, uh, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm been doing this and that for the church, and I'm doing this and that. And then you see something, and you go around and tell everybody about it. That's a gossip. That's double tongue too. You're acting like you're doing for God, but the fact is you're dividing when you're double-tongued. Listen, as an overseer, as a deacon, not just keeping souls in mind, but understanding that God might let you see something or know something through a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom supernaturally so that you can pray about it, not so you can talk about it. Happens a lot of times at prayer meeting. Oh, we better pray for brother so-and-so. Oh, why is that? Oh, well, didn't you hear? And then all of a sudden you get a 20-minute story instead of 20 minutes of prayer about brother so-and-so and how he's done this and that and the other thing. That's not concerned about a soul. That's not love covering a multitude of sin. That's not proper. Not double tongued. It actually means not ambiguous. In other words, people know what you're saying when you're saying it. You ever have to do that with people? They say something, go, what are you saying? Just tell me what you're saying. Let's communicate here. What are you saying? I call it making commitments. Commitments to your words, commitments to what you're saying, commitments in your life, commitments to Christ, not double-tongued. Oh, I might, might not. Well, what does that mean? I might, I might not. Can't rely on you then. I guess you're not going to be a deacon or an elder or probably won't even be here next week. Listen, it's not the conduct if we know Jesus Christ. 
Then he says, not given to much wine. Now, I got some issues here with this, but I don't have enough time. Elders, which overseers, which bishops, which was our first category, um, said not given to wine. And then we go down the ladder and it says not given to much wine. All right? And, and I would be thinking, that, oh, what are you saying? You better start drying it up, buddy, because if you want to go up the ladder, you got to start drying it up. Listen, all I can tell you is what the Bible says. One says not given to wine, the other one says not given to much wine. But I can also give you a whole bunch of other facts, like uh, the water in those days was contaminated. And what they would do with their wine is they just put enough in it to make the water palatable where you could drink it. So it wasn't like, it was watered down wine. It wasn't wine like they were trying to get drunk. It wasn't wine like they were trying to run around without being sober. It wasn't like our culture today where we're knocking back bottles of it and we think we're okay to have a glass of wine when we want. I believe the Bible does not teach perfect abstinence anywhere. But I believe perfectly that you should have complete abstinence and never drink. I'm telling you right here, it says not much wine. I'm telling you, he tells later, Timothy, drink a little wine with your belly. Proverbs 31 says, give wine to him who is perishing and strong drink. Excuse me, wine who is uh, miserable and strong drink to those who are perishing. I mean, the Bible talks about it, but it's not the same as our culture today. And I'm not saying God didn't know. What I'm saying is, and let me get this clear to you, is that the people of God should not drink. Now, I can have millions of arguments with that. Well, it's cultural for us to drink over here in Italy. It's cultural. That's what we do in Germany. Listen, all you have to do is start looking around you and look at the deaths that are caused by drinking. Look at why the government calls it sin taxes. All you have to do is look at the crime and the sexual sin and all the things that are going on because of drinking in our culture, and you would say, I absolutely do not want to drink because look what it's causing to humanity. And I'm concerned with souls. So why would I drink and stumble a soul? And it's the same thing Paul says when he says, talking about meats. If me eating meat causes a brother to stumble, I'll never eat meat again. Uh huh. That's what he said. But they were talking about meat that was sacrificed to false gods. And Paul says, well, I know there's no other God, so it doesn't bother me a bit. I can eat, give me a big hunk of that. I'll eat that. But if it causes somebody around me to stumble, I'm a vegetarian. That's simple. And I don't even think he meant he's a vegetarian. I just think he meant he would never eat meat that even suspected to be sacrificed to another God. Because he didn't want to make anybody stumble. And so the perfect point is, I go have me a beer, because I can do it, because I have liberty, and, and, and I'm not an alcoholic anymore, because I'm a new creation in Christ, so I'm not feared about it taking over my body, because I'm living for Jesus, and somebody sees me in the bar, knocking one back, and they don't understand freedom in Christ, they don't understand the blood of the Lamb, they don't understand a life of faith, and they go in and they drink a 12-pack and crash and kill themselves, and their soul goes to hell. Is that really what we're supposed to be doing? Leading a life where people would see that it's okay to drink? It's okay to do a bunch of pills? Because that's just as bad. It's the same thing anymore. The devil is using it the same way. We are supposed to be a light in a dark world. Not a light that gets halfway lit and goes, It's all right. Don't worry about it. It'll be okay. You got liberty in Jesus. You've been set free to follow Christ and be a witness for Christ because we've been given the, the ability to change a soul from where it's going to live eternity by the truth of God. Listen to me. You have that capability in your hand, in your heart, in your house to completely change somebody's eternity. Does it matter? Well, I don't want to mess up my liberty. Somebody else will witness to him. I'll be all right. Really? All because you want to drink?
So that's my opinion. Uh, I don't see total abstinence preached anywhere word for word, but I think that all one has to do is look. In fact, somebody, never mind, somebody gave a bunch of statistics about it, and I don't have them in front of me, so I'm not going to quote them. Because purposely, I believe that about 80% of statistics are all made up, so. 50% of the time. 50% of the time. <laughs> I do believe that. And, and, and if it's not made up, it's with a tainted study taking a pool of two when there's two million. And so you don't get a good answer that way anyway. What you do is you get a good paper that you can write that people will go, oh, really? And then you move on. So not given, it means really not hanging out at the bar is what it means. Not hanging out and tipping all the time. Uh, and that's what a tippling is, someone who drinks all the time. Not greedy for money. Listen, your motivation has to be souls of people in, in the kingdom of God. Money has nothing to do with it anymore. You can't have God and money. As you can't. You got to have one or the other. When you come to Jesus, you've got to make a decision. Am I going to worry about money or am I going to worry about God? Am I going to be obedient to God or am I going to follow money? And listen, again, because he's talking about deacons, servants that are handling material and physical things, excuse me, servants who are working in the food bank, You've got to deal with money sometimes. So you want people that their hearts are not on money so that they're stealing from the tithe box or stealing from the tithe plate. You don't have to worry about that because their hearts are on the souls of people and they'd rather see that money go into the checking account so they can spend it somewhere. And I believe that you've got to be very careful with the money that God gives you to take care of the bills of the church and the people of the church and the people that need help. You know, it, benevolence is a big thing that we need to be doing, but we also need to have honest people that would be checking out who is getting the money. You don't just give it to everybody that knocks on the door. Oh, you need money? Grandma's sick? Uh -huh, you know, okay, here's the money. You know, and in our culture, they call you on the phone, and I go, I don't, no, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't have any money for that right now. And they say, what? That's what the church does. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, come on down to my office. Let's talk about what the church does. You know, the church is supposed to be saving souls, not paying for your gas. And we've turned it, turned it into some type of a bingo club that you can get bingo money and gas money anytime you call. Because we think that's our number one route for evangelism is to pay people's bills. I think money is very important. And, and you know what? If you tithe here, I do not know who tithes here. I do not know where 99% of the money comes from. If we get something from somewhere outside, I might hear about it from somebody counting tithe. Uh, but you know what I do tell them? Is if you're counting tithe and it says in the memo that this is earmarked for a certain thing and it's a large amount of money, I ask them to call them people or talk to them people or I do it myself and say, hey, you donated some money. I don't know how much it is because I haven't looked at the check, but it says in the memo it's for the playground. We don't have a playground. So can you take that out of the memo? Because I believe when money is earmarked, it's state law, that if it's earmarked and given to a church for a certain purpose, then it has to be spent on that purpose. And I always talk about the playground because that's the big one that we, heard, that, that we were taught about is that some people donated $15,000 to a church for playground equipment. Well, the church a year before had totally remodeled the playground. So that money had to sit in that account until they needed some more playground equipment. So it's a waste if you put your, in, your tithe in the box and you put it for a specific purpose, I would pray that you would not do that, that you would trust us to know how to spend your money for God's people. Because I, I hate having money that sits there and, and I can't go take care of somebody's rent that needs their rent paid because I got the money, yeah, I got the money. I'm sorry, I can't send it on you though. It's, it's earmarked for something else. So I like to have complete reign to use it anytime. So... Uh, but if you like to earmark it, earmark it. I don't mind. We don't have a food bank, so don't put for the food bank on there. <laughs> but I do believe it's a very serious thing dealing with God's money. And um, um, that's even at your house. It should be a very serious thing because that's God's money's due. So if a person is greedy for money or concerned about money or chasing money, you really don't want them to be in charge of money. Because you don't know how they're going to handle it. You don't know whether they're going to treat it properly. You don't want them to be flipping about it. So their heart has to be on souls. 
holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. The mystery is not a who done it. Mystery is as God reveals to us, and He has. Remember the Old Testament? The law was a covering, it was a kofar. Well, in the New Testament, He took the cover off. And he's revealed to us that it was Jesus Christ of Nazareth who was the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. And he begins to reveal to us all the truth that was hidden throughout the angels, er, the, the, the ages, things that angels wanted to look into. And he's revealed it to us. And so even if you're only dealing with physical material, you have to also have faith to deal with the mysteries and the revelation that God gives you of the truth of the Word of God in the right way. So as you know the truth, you should be living the truth, not hearing the truth and then going away and just continuing to deceive yourself. Mystery. Had a note somewhere on that. It means to shut the mouth. That's what mystery means. God shut his mouth. He was speaking, but he shut his mouth and he didn't reveal what he meant by that until the church and then he reveals it he opened his mouth again and said it's jesus my son so he shut his mouth and there's things that he still shut his mouth on but then he begins to reveal them and that's the mystery that you and i are supposed to be working with as we know the truth we're supposed to be living it and telling others about it he uncovers it it's the mystery of the faith with a pure moral conscience. With a pure heart. Faith. Mystery of the faith. Faith in what? What do you have faith in? See, I'm telling you, 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 I talk to people all the time. Listen to me seriously. And they'll go, well, I got faith. Well, I believe. But they never go any further. Oh, you guys go to church somewhere? Yeah, I believe. That's the end of the statement. What do you believe in? What do you have faith in? See, those are important things that we need to know. Even if you're painting a wall, somebody walks up and sees you. I remember when I got saved, and the sound guy was, 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 was running sound. Not picking on him. He was running sound. I thought he was spiritual. And he's off cussing and smoking cigarettes and living like a heathen outside the building. He was a cap that could run sound, not even good, but he ran it. And I was looking at him. And so I go to help him build some stuff in his house. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. And I wasn't three weeks old in the Lord, and I knew he was wrong. And he's not in the church anymore either. He's not, he's not even living for Jesus. He's mad at God. But it wasn't because of anything God did. It was because he was putting his faith someplace else other than in the blood of Jesus. He was putting his faith in man, and man made him mad, and so he left the church. But at the same time, man should have never made him a sound man until he was tested to have proved himself that his life was really changing and that he really had the Holy Spirit in him and he really had faith in the blood of the Lamb. You can't put your faith in the pastor or your faith in the church or your faith in some chairs or in how somebody's going to speak to you next week. Your faith has to be in the blood of the Lamb. That's the mystery that's been revealed. Your faith has to be in the one sacrifice, the ransom that paid for your sin nature to be cleaned up so you can begin to be children of God. And understand how to conduct yourself in the house of God for the glory of God. But let these also first be tested. Tried, approved, put on trial. So you don't make them a deacon and then start testing them. Listen to me. You've been watching them. They've been a, a sheep that's been in the pen and, and they're coming to church and you're watching how they conduct and treat people. I look for leaders, I'm going to tell you right now, I look for leaders only in the prayer meeting because it starts in prayer. And if you're concerned about somebody's soul, you're going to make sure you're in prayer. And in fact, I've always said it and I'll say it again, I'd rather you be at prayer than here today. Because if you ain't praying for the sheep, you don't care about the sheep. 
That's as simple. I don't have any other words to say. If you can't pray for people, you don't care for people. That's where it starts. Some people can take offense at that or, or take exception with it. And so I look for people that are already being faithful. That's, that's the testing. And then you let them serve as deacons. You don't give them something to do uh, uh, just because they're there. And when you test them, they need to be found blameless. That's not perfect. That's in Christ. And chiefly, they're trying to be worthy and do what they're supposed to be doing. You don't test them and then find out where they could care less and they're all across town being double-tongued. Likewise, their wives. Uh-oh. I might have to quit, maybe. Likewise, their wives must be sober, reverent, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things. <coughs> Why is that? Remember what we talked about last week? The training ground and the teaching ground and the future generation of the church all depends upon the home. It all depends upon the home. If a man can't run his own home, if he can't lead in a way where he's loving his wife as Christ loved the church and his wife is out doing all these things and she's not come underneath his authority, then, then, then why would anybody think you could make him a leader in the church and everybody else going to come underneath his authority? His wife is all buck wild and crazy and ain't listening to nothing. She's the one that sees him at home and she ain't come underneath his authority because he's not loving and serving right. And I'm telling you that 99.9% .9 of the time, it's because of his relationship with the Lord at home. The number one place that he spends most of his time and his wife's not following him, why would we expect sheep to follow him? Why would we make him a leader in the church? Some people have tried to interject their speculation and say maybe this really is just talking about women when they become deaconesses like Phoebe was. Phoebe, for you people that don't know there's an O in it in most texts, so I say Phoebe because I'm a nut with the English language and I've never met anybody named Phoebe. So it might as well be Phoebe to me. <laughs> Some people are laughing because they make fun of my words all the time that I use. And you guys don't know that, but they have their own little clique of English majors. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So when I finally say it right, you guys, ever, you guys that work on cars, you guys ever seen an idolator? I said idolator for so long instead of idolatry. I said idolator. <laughs> I'm okay with that. As long as you get the point that I'm trying to make. <laughs> so look, it begins in the home. And so it's all modeled in the home where the husband's loving and leading and the wife is submitting and following and the children are going, oh, there's authority, there's order, there's proper boundaries, and there's discipline when it doesn't happen right. And then they learn to be the church, they learn to grow up, and then they learn that there's respect and there's, there's a proper reverence and honesty and honorability. Is that a word? There's honor and, there's, and, and it's in the home. And it's witness to the neighbors. And then it can become a part of the church. Whether it's material and physical things. Or whether it's even teaching. If God would give you the gift of teaching. It all works out for God's order. For God's authority. For God's kingdom. And it's all done by the blood of the Lamb. The power of the Holy Spirit. And by faith. You can't do anything in your own strength. <laughs> You have to have faith in the blood, the finished work of the cross, and then trust in the power of the Holy Spirit to fill you and use you for God's service for such a time as this. And unless you say, I'm crucified with Christ and I no longer live, the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the blood of the Lamb, faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself a ransom for me. I'm adding words. I know that on purpose. That's what's inferred. Unless you say that, you never get to the place of surrender to the Holy Spirit who's handing out all the riches of Christ. That's what grace is. 
so that you can go and be a witness to other people. A witness to what? Hey, there's some graces. Hey, there's some goodness. Hey, there's God and there's an inheritance. You're being a witness to their salvation. There's hope. This is not the end of it. You guys know we live in the house of God. We've become children of God. We have our hope in God, who is our Savior. And when he appears, we're supposed to be like him. Moving in that direction now. Be faithful, not slanderous. Sober is the word, really, not reverent. We already dealt with reverent. Let deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own house as well. Now, we covered this last week, but I have a sidebar because somebody thought that I left it hanging with the only way you could be a husband of one wife is if you didn't have a harem. That's not what I was saying. But in the culture, in the day, not only Christians and Jews, but pagans, they all had more than one wife. Not everybody, by all, I didn't mean emphatically, but a lot of them in the culture did. And so one of the requirements was that you could only have one wife. God never approved of having more than one wife. And so thus, there are those that say that if you've been divorced, you cannot be in leadership. And I have to agree. I have to agree that that's what those words would mean if you look at them in the strictest of sense. <clears throat> that if you've been divorced, God already knew down the corridors of time that you were leading your home improperly and you had gotten divorced because of improper living. And, and, and I can't make any excuses or try to strain it for you. But I can tell you that one of my favorite teachers, Chuck Stanley, his wife divorced him, and he went before his elders and he said, I'll step down if you need me to. And they said, no, we've watched your character, we've watched your life, and we know that your wife has been mentally ill for all these years, and you've laid your life down and taken care of her, and we do not believe that we should follow the letter of the law after watching this and seeing it happen. And you do not have to step down. And I believe that in all of the Bible, God's grace has to win. It wins out. I'm not trying to change the word of God. Because it says if you have been married, because marriage is forever, God hates divorce. It's forever. He hates divorce. Well, Greg, we really have a culture where the church is all divorced. I can't change the word of God because people are doing what they're doing and the culture is living the way they're living. I have to leave the apple cart in its place where I found it and keep teaching it. But I believe it is the spirit of the law that we should be following and not the letter. So I believe that in some cases you have to take it case by case and say, what is it about? Because God gives forgiveness and God gives grace. And that's the best I can do with that. I'm not apologizing for God's word, not one bit. It says, if you're the husband of one wife, that's it. So if you've been married two or three times, can't be a leader in the church. There's plenty of other things you can do. If you really want to be a servant, and if you're really being a servant and God's changed your life, then maybe people might consider uh, seeing what God would say about it. Best I can do with that for those who want to be used. Because the training ground, everything depends upon the home. And if the home life has been damaged, then why would we stick people into those places that would damage the church when they could not rule their own home well? For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness, that's because of their witness, in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. And they talk about, in the King James, that the word degree is used. <clears throat> that's what I started with. It's a step. Um, it's, a, it's like a grade of dignity, like you're climbing up steps. 
So we're always supposed to be on the grow. We're always supposed to be climbing higher in our conscience, in our moral uh, uh, um, uh, obedience, in our um, surrender to God's word and learning and growing and, and growing in our witness with great boldness because of faith in the blood of Jesus. And when that's happening, then you're learning the word and you can move forward and climb into the position uh, God willing, uh, by the power of his spirit, of an elder, a pastor, uh, whatever he does, it's up to him. It's his kingdom. It's his glory. It's his, it's his apple cart. It's his design. And we must keep it there. It doesn't matter if the world is changing and shifting and has taken everything and made it politically correct. And, and you know, I mean, I, I, all you got to do, guys, is look. Every type of sin has been labeled some type of disorder. Even in the church, we call them disorders. We say they need a psychologist. The apple cart has been flipped upside downward. We need to get back to the truth of God's word and just say, that's what he said. When the devil says, did God really say? We say, yes, he did. Get behind me, Satan. He said, that's exactly what his word said, and that's what it meant. If not, we're just playing church. If not, we're just pretending. And I believe we do that no matter what the pressure is, no matter what the persecution is, no matter what the church playbook says, we stick with the word of God in this book, 66 books by 40 authors. And as he reveals it, we have to be able to live it by faith. Father, we give you praise. Lord, we ask you to raise up leaders around us. But Lord, we pray that it would be people that don't need a title, that don't need a position, but they know that you are, you are uh, the head of the house, the Father, and they are children in your house. And because of your kingdom, they serve and give themselves away. Teach us proper conduct in your house, and this world that's turning to sway the wicked one for eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The Lord bless you.